understand or obey me It's your choice I'll pick you water Can you hear my voice? Trust and obey me It's your choice
Okay, pop quiz tonight. How many of each did Noah take on the ark? How many of each animal did Noah take on the ark? How many of you have been in Sunday school growing up? Okay. And how many have seen the pictures painted on the walls of two by two and two by two and even songs that go two by two? I won't try to sing the two by two song, but, but two by two. Well, would, would it shock you to, to learn that that is not the truth or the whole truth? So help us God. That is a, it is, it's not all of it. And so we're going to dig back into the scriptures tonight and find out what the scriptures say about just this introduction pop quiz. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. It says, Then Yahweh said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. What does righteous mean? It means that he did what Yahweh told him to do. Okay. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, and two each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female. So isn't that interesting that, that we've all grown up with the concept of two by two, and I will be honest with you, before I studied this, I, I never in a million years, I thought it was hard enough to fit two by two into that ark, much less that there was seven of each of the clean animals. So that ark is far bigger than I thought it was. And Yahweh is far more amazing uh, to be able to fit all of the world's population of the animals in that ark. So why is it that he said seven of every clean animal and two of every unclean animal? I want to propose this topic to you tonight. I want to propose this, this concept to you tonight that that's, there is something in the scriptures, even in Genesis, that's uh, it's mysterious because we don't see the word clean and unclean until the Levitical law is given on Mount Sinai. So let me ask a question, how on earth did, did Noah know or even have the concept that there is such thing as clean animals and unclean animals? We're going to dig into this this evening. Let me ask a question, does God care about what we say? Yes. He does. Yahweh cares about the things that comes out of our mouth. Does He care about what we do? Absolutely, no question about it. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about what we do. How about what we think? Most importantly, we, thought we learned about this uh, a month or so ago through the great uh, deception that Yahweh cares about what we think and so does the enemy and the enemy loves to get into our mind and bend it back towards the tree of knowledge of good and evil. How about what, how we dress? Oh, that's a, t yes, I didn't get very many amens on that. He does care. He wants us to be modest. He wants us to represent Him. If He didn't care, folks, how we dress, if anyone ever tells you that Yahweh does not care how you dress, then why did He spend chapters telling the priest exactly how to dress before Him? Why is it that He told them not only which clothes to wear, I think it would have been enough to just say, here are the garments, put them on in whatever order you think is cool. But He told them exactly what to put on first, Second, third, fourth, even the colors and the types of fabric that he wanted. Yahweh cares about the very fiber, no pun intended, of your being. How about what we see? He cares about what you see. He cares about what you see. He cares about what you see. I said it three times, and if you were a rabbi, uh, you study Judaism, you know that's important when, when Yahweh says something more than once. So listen up, because Yahweh says that, th that the eye, what comes in through the eye gate will come out through the mouth gate and will come out through the heart gate. In the days where I raced motorcycles, and I've said this a million times, but I'll say it again for somebody that hasn't heard it. When you race motorcycles or you, or you drive cars, actually this is way more, uh, a better analogy for those that are teenagers. How many teenagers out there driving cars today? Any teenagers out there driving cars? <laughs> No, no, not, not that you feel like a teenager, like you really are a teenager. <laughs> well, here's something that I learn every single day, and I'm not a teenager, but I do this, but did you know that what you look at, that's where you go? How many have had your wife hit you in the shoulder while you're driving? Honey, stay on the road. I always tell my wife, why do you think they put the bumps on the side of the road? They're for me. What do, what do I need to look for? All I got to do is wait for the sound, and I know I'm out of line. It's kind of like a, a street shofar, really. 
What you look at is where you're going to go. When I raced motorcycles, if I came around a turn and I saw a big rock there and it brought fear into my heart, guess what? If I looked at that rock, I'd hit it every single time. So my nice brother-in-law comes up to me one day and says, Jim, don't look at it. And you won't hit it. And it's 100% fact every single time that I saw a rock or a big root or a tree limb that's fallen or worst case scenario, a, a tree that is kind of halfway over the trail that can hit you like a baseball bat, that if I didn't look at it, I never hit it every single time. I still looking at it at the corner of my eye, but if you don't look at it, you won't hit it. So where you want to go in life is dependent on what you see. It's what you look at. This is why the way that you look at the scriptures is so critical, because how you see the scriptures is how you're going to live your life and how you live your life is, is, how you're go, is, is how your life is going to be determined whether it will be successful in his eyes or not. So if you don't see properly and you have scales on your eyes or, or you don't interpret the scriptures the way that Yahweh penned them, you will go in a different direction that's not intended and you will hit a tree or a rock. And then you will wake up and you'll start praying asking the Father, why did you, why did you hit me with that rock? Why did you let that tree hit me? Never even considering that maybe you're not looking straight. He cares about what we see. How about what we hear? Sensitive subjects. He cares about what you hear. Where are you at and what you are listening to? From music to people to conversations that aren't unholy. What you listen to, what goes in your ear, goes right into the seven inches that causes you to act. This seven inches, it's a game of seven inches as they say in golf. And it's incredible how the Father can, can get into your mind and, 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 and cause you to go in this direction. And it's incredible how the enemy can get into your mind and cause you to go in another direction. And both times you don't even have a clue you're being used. And that may mess with your mojo doctrine. But I want to assure you that Yahweh can use you and you don't even know it. How many believe that? that you can minister to someone and not even know it. And you don't even know what you said. How many have said that person doesn't even know what he this just said? They just said something that, that uh, you don't even know. I'll give you a perfect example, maybe not a perfect example, but today on the way here, I uh, heard a song come on the radio, When the Stars Burn Down, I think is the title of it. And, uh, and I was singing at the top of my lungs with my kids in the car, and I, and I said, Father, what an amazing song this is. This would be awesome if we could sing this in worship. I had no idea that Deanne had picked that song out to sing tonight. <laughs> now, do you think that was a coincidence? No, not at all. The Father moves in mysterious ways. Be careful of what you hear. How about where we go? important where we go. Well, let me ask you this. If he cares about all those things, what we see, what we hear, what we do, what we think, what we listen to, what we dress, how, you know, all of these things, are you, are you telling me that he doesn't care about what we eat? Every single topic that can be found in human nature today, we, no Christian or religious person alive would say that the, any deity much less the king of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, doesn't care about a part of our life. I have not met anybody yet that would say that God doesn't care about a part of me. He says he knows every single hair on your head and he has it numbered. So he probably cares about what kind of shampoo you use too, but that's a different topic. Make sure it's organic. Let's find out if he cares about what we eat. So tonight's message is called to eat or not to eat. That is the question. Does God care about what we eat? Because I cannot tell you how many times I have had people tell me, and I have to say that I was on their side of the fence once. It took me three years to study this topic. Three years. Two and a half of those years were out of rebellion because I didn't want to study the topic. But I did study this topic for, for, for several years and I've been on the other side to say and defend that, that God doesn't really care. He, he loves, he wants you to enjoy everything that he created. Well, let's find out tonight what the scriptures actually say. So can we start off by agreeing that we are only going to allow the scriptures to be our final authority? 
We are not going to read into the scriptures. We are going to, ex, it's called exegesis. We are going to ex, uh, ex, exegetically pull from the scriptures what the scriptures say. We're not going to take what we say and eisegetically read into there what we already believe. So everyone ignore right now, wherever you are, take your bias and put it aside and let's just examine the scriptures. One of the things that I see all the time as, as a Bible teacher, uh, and specifically a Torah teacher, unfortunately, the number one thing that causes people to not learn the truth is pride. They will not put their pride down for just a moment to even examine whether or not what they believe is true. And so that's exactly what we're going to do tonight. If the crea- Let me ask you a question. If the creator of the universe asked you to stop eating chocolate, would you do it? Well, you answer quicker than I would. Because I'd have to pray about it. So there are more holy people in the world, I know that. But no, seriously, if the creator of the universe asked me to stand on my head and pat my tummy and chew gum all at the same time, you'd have to ask yourself, that's a pretty strange request. But would you do it? Now, see, we say with our, our heart, with, our, with our, our minds and our mouths that we would do whatever the Father tells us to do. But why don't we? When he says, uh, let me go on a tangent, when he says to love your neighbor as yourself, why don't we? When he says to, uh, to go to your neighbor when you have odd against your neighbor and tell them in love, why don't we? Why do we go somewhere else and gossip? So how, see how easy it is? See why you know Yahweh's perspective in Isaiah when he says, my people, they serve me with my lips, but their hearts are far from me, meaning that they, they say that they love me, but they really don't do what I ask them to do. And this is why 1 John chapter 5, if you read it, says, here is the love of God, those who keep his commandments. Because loving is doing. Ask your wife if she thinks that you love her, and I guarantee you it will be connected in the things that you do for her. Because love is not a verbal action. A wife would rather never be told that that you love her, but you display it every single minute of the day. She would prefer both, probably. I love you, honey. All right. So we agree that whatever Yahweh says, we should do. So let's find out what he says on this topic. But first, let's discover what the definition of legalistic is. Because, you know, how many know that this term gets thrown out there? Oh, you're legalistic, you're legalistic. You wear pants, you're legalistic. You wear a dress, you're legalistic. You shave your hair, you wear it in a bun. You wear a head covering. You bring this to church, you do a flag. You don't do a flag. You sit, you stand, you lay down. All of us are legalistic. It just depends on the definition that you use. So let's get it out. Legalism, according to Webster's Dictionary, is a strict, conformity to the letter of the law rather than its spirit, okay? And so we want to discover whether or not keeping God's commandments is legalistic. So I thought this might be a creative way to discover what legalism is if legalism is keeping God's commandments. Let's go through the Ten Commandments, shall we? All right, number one, no other gods before Yahweh. Is it legalistic to do this. Now wait a minute, you're being legalistic. Are you telling me I can only have one God? (laughs) How about this one, do not make any graven images. Well, what if I just only make one? Jim, you're being legalistic to tell me I can't have one single graven image? I think you're taking that scripture out of context. How about do not take the name of the Lord God's name in vain? And this is without going on a tangent, a very misunderstood scripture. In Hebrew, what this really means is do not make any promises in Yahweh's name and don't keep it because it makes his name common, okay? Uh, Meaning uh, it's like regular, uh, it's like every other name. So if you're going to make a promise and you do so in Yahweh's name, keep it. It's not legalistic to not take his name in vain. Would you agree? How about keep the Shabbat? Let's skip that one and come back. Honor your father and your mother. 
Now, it's okay every once in a while to dishonor them, right? I mean, uh, to, come on, nobody's perfect. Uh, it's legalistic to even try. How about number six? You shall not murder. Can you imagine someone saying that the sixth commandment is legalistic? You're legalistic, Jim, if you actually take that literally. How else are you to take it? Number seven, you should not commit adultery. There are people that would argue this case, that it's legalism to only have one spouse. Do you know that? There are people in certain states that will tell you that to have one spouse is, uh, is legalistic. How can you say this and that and the other? And unfortunately, if we live in Christian circles and the religious society today does not have a strong stance on the commandment of God and what he says goes, then every homosexual advocate group out there has our chain. Why? Because you can't pick and choose. Either you're going to say that uh, the Shabbat is legal. Now, we don't really have to keep that because if I'm a homosexual, I'm going to say, well, then why should I do this? If you say one is, 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 is bendable, why wouldn't this be bendable? You see how that works? It's hypocritical in theology. Either you believe it all or you don't believe it. That's why it's called God's Word. It's one from His perspective. He spoke it. It came out all at once. Only for us, because we only use less than 5% of our brain as we break it down into individual words. Number eight, you should not steal. It's not legalistic to not steal. Number nine, you should not lie. Think about what we're saying. You shall not covet. No one in their right mind that believes in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would say that it would be legalistic to break any of these commandments or to keep any of these commandments. Yet amazingly, the fourth commandment made it in the top five of keep the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, if you read the, the commandments in Exodus chapter 20, you will find it goes on for multiple verses talking about the Sabbath. It's the only commandment of the top 10 where he goes on and on about it and defines exactly what it means in depth. None of the other commandments does he even give, give uh, you know, uh, sub points. But the Sabbath, he describes it in great detail so where there's no wiggle room and leave it to us Israelites, we wiggle right out of it. And say, oh, it it didn't really mean that. You're not really going to die. See how the serpent's voice even comes deep down inside of us. It comes out and we don't even know it. And then we start calling Yahweh's commandments legalistic. Can I submit to you that it's not legalistic to keep his commandments, it's legal. Is it legalistic to stop at a red light? Be my guest and run a red light and say, oh, you know, this one's only, uh, it's, it's one out of every 10 is not bad. That's 90%, that's still an A. In high school, that would have been good. But that one out of 10 of breaking that constitutional commandment or that state law might get you killed. So it's just legal. Doing what God says to do is not legalistic. Going beyond, this is the definition that Jim Staley has for this or what the Father put on my heart. Going beyond what he said to do for the sake of religious piety or obeying a command without being mindful of the spirit of the command is legalism. Did you know that you can obey Yahweh's commandment and still be legalistic? Because the very definition of legalism is forgetting the spirit of the law. So a judge, now our court system does this all the time. Amazing laws were created, like uh, the law of bearing arms. How many think that's a pretty good law? Did you know that there are groups out there today probably one of the strongest movements in the world today with the United Nations and Canada leading this, I believe, is they believe that, that guns kill people. I agree. So begun, because guns kill people or guns can kill people, therefore we should not have guns. You see how that works? 
I say, because guns kill people, I should have a gun because the people that they kill are probably the bad guys. And they're not working in other, in other countries. Other countries right now, they're repealing the guns. Guess what? The criminals have parties. It's easier to hold someone up if you know there's not a gun in their purse. So the spirit of the law is to protect yourself. You have the right to protect yourself. But what happens is judges are beginning to make rulings on this kind of subject and many other subjects based on the letter and not taking in co into consideration the intent. Do you understand? So how did Noah know which animals were clean when the law wasn't given until over a thousand years later? By the way, did you know that Noah would have known Abraham? They lived at the same time. Pretty incredible thought. No need to email or write it on stone tablet and you know, send it down the road. Tell him personally. Noah's three generations removed from Adam, ladies and gentlemen. How did he know what clean and unclean was? Because he wasn't so far removed from the garden where there was personal relationship, where Yahweh clearly had some instructions in the garden because he gave them what's called the Moedim, the seasons, the appointed times, where the sun, moon, and stars are used to, for the feast days, to set the feast days and the Shabbat. We know that they had sacrifices in the garden. We have Cain and Abel. So they clearly had ideas of what sacrificial system was and so on and so forth. There was relationship. There was instruction. Where there's instruction, that's called Torah. That's called learning, instruction, a blueprint, a GPS, giving us the way. Noah knew exactly what was clean and unclean because it was built into the instructions of the garden. That's where he learned it. So let's begin our journey through the scriptures tonight and find out exactly what the scriptures say. We're going to go through every single verse in the Bible that has to deal with this subject. And we're going to unpack it and find out what Yahweh has to say on this topic. Genesis chapter 9 verse 3 is the very first time that it seems to indicate that man can eat whatever he wants. It says, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. Now, if you don't know context and you don't know Bible hermeneutics, it, th this really sounds like we can eat anything that moves. It's what it says. Every living thing that, that moves shall be food for you. I'm sure he meant the poisonous tree frog at the same time as the pit viper snake, right? Well, let's find out. Let's look a little bit more carefully because we'll see something here. We have to make some... Uh, we don't want to make assumptions. We want the Bible to interpret itself. Let me ask this. Is Noah going to eat something that he already knows is unclean? Think about that for a moment. Noah knows that certain animals are unclean. So you're telling me that Noah ate animals that he knows are unclean. Yes or no? It doesn't matter. You can choose whatever you want. We're going to keep asking this question. But now we know what happened to the dodo bird. Because how many dodo birds were on the ark? Maybe he ate all seven. But imagine if he would have ate a giraffe. Imagine if he'd ate a horse. You wouldn't even have any horses today because there was only two horses on the ark. Something's going on here. Let's, let's, let's dig in this a little bit more carefully. Let's read it again. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 129 where it gives us instructions on the herbs and see if there's something to miss here. God said, see, I have given you every herb that's what it says in Genesis 9.3. Or does it say every herb that yields seed? You see, he qualified the herb statement of Genesis 9.3. He doesn't have to say every herb that bears seed, does he? Because he already said it in Genesis chapter 9. I mean, Genesis chapter 1. Do you understand where I'm going with this? He already gave the definition of what you can eat as far as green herbs. I'm going to submit to you that he already gave him the definition of food. 
So here we have to ask the Father, please make up your mind. Make up your mind, because here's what we have ultimately. If we can eat whatever we want today, then this is what it looks like. In the garden, he says that pigs are unclean. Then, in Genesis chapter 9, eight chapters later, we're not even ten chapters into the Bible, Yahweh's changing his mind already. And now pigs are clean, supposedly. When you get to Moses, he changes his mind again, and now they're unclean. When Yeshua comes, he dies for the pigs, so now they're clean. And then when Yeshua comes back, he says they're unclean again because we have scriptures condemning anyone that eats of swine's flesh or the mouse in the millennium. So he's unclean, they're clean, they're unclean, they're clean, and they're clean, unclean. That's very, I can't even say it, it's so confusing. So we have, I'm going to submit that Yahweh does not change his mind, that he's the same today forever. And that what he says he meant from the beginning, and somehow we're the ones misunderstanding what he's saying. But if you, if you read into the scriptures what you already believe, then you have to have God change his mind. And I'm here to tell you that when he created the animals, he knew exactly what he's doing. He created some of them to vacuum the earth, some of them to absorb all the toxins, and some of them for us to eat. You're going to learn some awesome stuff tonight in science in just a few minutes. Somebody sing the song for me. I've seen just about everything, right? When I see an elephant fly, remember that song? How about pigs fly? Did you know that Jesus died for pigs? And they're excited about that. I'm just making fun, but the truth is, is I want to make fun of us as human beings and how we think in our logic. Because I used to think this way. Think about the logic for just a moment. The day before Yeshua dies, the Messiah, pigs are unclean. But the very next day, when he rises from the dead, they're clean. Huh? Toxic? Not toxic. What's going on in this logic that we have? I'm going to suggest that pigs became clean because we wanted to eat them. So we look for scriptures to get around it. But let's talk about it for a moment. Let's go right to the scripture that talks about food. And let's read Leviticus chapter 11. I don't have my iPad with me. Look at this. I turned right to it. So that's a... Maybe that's a sign I should go back to paper Bibles. All right. So we're going to read, and, uh, and I'm going to read uh, some of this chapter here. And, and, and so you guys know exactly what the Bible says. Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the living creatures which you do eat among all the beasts are on the earth. Whatever has a split hoof completely divided, chewing the cud among the beast, that you can eat. So it has to have a split, hoof, a split hoof and chew the cud, like a deer. A deer has a completely split hoof and it chews the cud. Only these you do not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have a split hoof. The camel, because it chews the cud but it does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. The rabbit, because it chews the cud but it doesn't have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. The hare, and the pig, though it has a split hoof, completely divided, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. Their flesh you do not eat, and their carcasses you do not touch, they are unclean to you. These you do eat of all that are in the waters, any one that has fins and scales. So a fish has to have fins, and it has to have scales. And the waters, and the seas, and the rivers do, do eat. But if it doesn't have fins and scales in the seas and the rivers, all that move in the waters, any living being which is in the waters, they are an abomination to you. They are an abomination to you of their flesh do not eat, and their carcasses are abomination. All that have not fins or scales in the waters are an abomination to you, and these you do not abominate among the birds. They are not eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the vulture and the black vulture, and the hawk, and the falcon after its kind, and every raven after its kind. Why would he say that? They're scavengers. You're eating birds that eat dead animals and roadkill. See, some of this stuff is common sense. I mean, who is driving down the road and sees a dead skunk and goes, ooh, that bird looks really... <laughs> Honey, pull over. Nobody. There's a reason why Yahweh gave a vulture a clean head. And there's no fur on its head. 
I won't say why, but I'll let you uh, figure it out. Okay, only these you do not eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours. Those which have jointed legs above their feet with which to leap on the earth. So what does that sound like? A grasshopper. So you can eat grasshoppers. And there are cultures that do that. Good for them. <laughs> I'll wait till the great tribulation. <laughs> so praise God. These of them you do eat. The locust after its kind, and the solemn locust after its kind, and the hargal locust after its kind. You can eat a locust. But all their flying insects which have four feet are an abomination to you. And by these you are made unclean. Anyone touching the carcass of any of them is unclean until evening. And anyone picking up part of the carcass or any of them has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. Did you know that science, that this is the only religion in the world, bar none. I read a science article on this just yesterday. Wish I could remember what it was. I give you the, the, uh, the address, but you can find it probably online. But Christianity or Judaism, the Bible religion, is the only religion known to man in the history of the world to have the most sanitary health religious system built into it. That science is just now catching up to in the last hundred years. The way that God tells them to eat and to clean things is the, there is no, did you know that in some religions, and especially Egyptian, did you know Egyptians uh, were said to have the most advanced culture? Even today, secularism will tell you that, that, that the Egyptians had the most advanced culture, but their medical practices and their health standards were terrible. Terrible. From drinking blood to not uh, washing before they eat and so on and so forth. And look at the Jewish people or the Israelites all the way back in the Bible. God's telling them, hey, by the way, if you touch a dead carcass, wash your body and your clothes. Why? It stops disease. Ritual or makes sense? Every, in verse 26, every beast that has a split hoof not completely divided or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Anyone who touches their carcasses are unclean. Whatever goes on its paws, among all the creatures that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. Anyone who touches their carcasses, de de dead is what it's talking about, so it doesn't mean that you can't pet your dog, okay? We get emails on that. It makes sense, but that's what says carcass, okay? He who picks up their carcass has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. So we're not talking, ladies and gentlemen, about sin here, okay? As far as if you accidentally touch a dead carcass, all right? So if, if, you, uh, if you come across something and you don't even know it's dead, I'm just throwing this out there, you have to wash your, your hands, wash your body, and, and wash your clothes, and you're unclean until evening. These are unclean to you among all the creeping creatures that creep on the earth, the mole and the mouse and the tortoise after its kind, the gecko and the land crocodile, safe for me, and the sand reptile and the sand lizard and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Anyone who touches them when they are dead becomes unclean until evening. And it goes on and talks about all these different things. In verse 33 it says, And any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, whatever is in it becomes unclean and you break it. Now you may or may not know about ancient earthen vessels, but there's two kinds mainly. You have those that are made out of stone, and you have those that are made out of what? Out of clay. Okay, now clay is a very, very porous uh, uh, object. And so if you have, and most of the common people had clay pots and bowls. And so if you had a fly land into your, or a bat or whatever, uh, land, that's something that's unclean, land into your soup bowl, you're not allowed to eat it. Why? Because the bacteria will go into, you're not just not allowed to eat the soup, you had to destroy the bowl. Because once the bacteria goes into the pores of that bowl, you can't get it out. You understand what I'm saying? So Yahweh's so smart, he doesn't just say, you can't eat the soup. He says, destroy the bowl. Now, if you're just a common person and you're not very rich, and you just can't go down to Walmart because, you know, to get another you know, pot set, another bowl set, then that becomes a big problem. But what if you don't listen to Yahweh? You want to keep your bowl or do you want to live? It's totally up to you. And sometimes today we're in the same situation. Do you want to obey what Yahweh says or you, because you don't understand it, you don't want to do it? Or do you want to live? That's why he says, just do what I say and you'll live. 
you'll be blessed. Don't do what I say, it's not my fault. I'm telling you, but I'm not telling you all the details. Do parents have to tell their children all the details? Verse 41, and every swarming creature, the one that swarms on the earth is an abomination. It is not to be eaten. Whatever crawls on its stomach and whatever goes on all fours or whatever has many feet among all swarming creatures, like a centipede, the ones swarming on the earth, those do not eat for they are an abomination. Do not make yourselves abominable with any swarming creature. Verse 44, for I am Yahweh, your Elohim, and you shall set yourselves apart. You shall be set apart for I am set apart. Do you know what that word is in Hebrew? Kadosh. So let me read this again like you may see it in your Bibles. For I am Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall be holy, and you shall be holy for I am holy. Isn't that amazing that he is connecting being holy with what you eat? What? That's pretty strange. For I am Yahweh who is bringing you up out of the land of Mitzrayim to be your Elohim, and you shall be set apart for I am set apart. This is the Torah of the beast and the birds and every living being, the creeping creature in the waters and every being that swarms on the earth, to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the living creature that is eaten and the living creature that is not eaten. Folks, 47 verses in the Bible are dedicated to what you eat. There's one that says, have no other gods but me. Do you think it's important? Maybe, maybe not. Let's continue. But I wanted to share with you, this is what the Bible says. These are the instructions that it gave the ancient Israelites. What we want to discover in this teaching today is whether or not it's still applicable for us today. Be holy. 1 Peter 1.15, this is where you heard it before. But as he who's called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Can you believe it? How many knew that verse 16 of 1 Peter chapter 1 is quoting Leviticus chapter 11, talking about the clean and unclean food laws? I don't know about you, but as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a Christian in my former days of apologetics and defending the Bible, I never knew that he was quoting from the food laws. Do you think that, that uh, the, the, the apostle that wrote this knew that? Yeah. Of course he did. So would, you, would, it, would it be a suggestive comment or easy uh, 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 to agree with me that he probably agreed with Leviticus chapter 11? To quote from something is typically normally saying that you agree. When you say, I'm Abraham Lincoln said this, normally you agree with it. What's he saying? Moshe said this in Leviticus chapter 11. Be holy. No one would accuse the author of Peter here of misquoting or taking the word out of context. If he's using be holy because I am holy and he's taking it out of the context just because it sounds good. We have a big problem. That means we can't trust the entire Brit out of shot if apostles are taking the Bible out of context. Agree? Okay, let's ramp it up here. John Hopkins Institute, 1953. This is very fascinating. There was a gentleman uh, that, that wrote a paper that got published in John Hopkins uh, papers or by, by the Institute here in 1953 where he decided, you know what, I'm going to do some, some research on this Leviticus chapter 11 stuff. He was a scientist and he took uh, all kinds of unclean animals and all kinds of clean animals and all kinds of unclean fish and clean fish and he wanted to find out if there's any science behind why God said what he did. What do you think he found out? That God's smarter than we are. Here's what he said. Of special interest were experiments made with muscle juices and also blood solutions obtained from many species of fishes. 54 species of fish were so far studied in regard to toxicity of meat extracts. It was found that the muscle extracts of those fishes were, which possessed scales and fins, exactly what the Bible says is clean, were practically non-toxic, while muscle extracts from fishes without skins and scales and fins were highly toxic for the growth of lupinous albus seedlings. He goes on to say that when he, when he did a, a scientific studies on clean and unclean animals, what he did was he discovered that over 90% 
of the seedlings that he tried to grow in these little petri dishes from the juices of these animals when they were clean animals grew. Less than 50% of the unclean animals grew. It was across the board that, they, that the animals that were unclean were 100% more toxic. There was almost zero toxicity in clean animals. So did you know that science has discovered that every single disease known to man, every one bar none, is connected to a cellular disorder of toxicity. That when your cells are toxic, it releases those toxi that toxins into the oxygen of the bloodstream and it takes it and tries to get rid of it. But if it finds a weakness in the body's bloodstream somewhere, it will settle there and there now you have a hyperactive thyroid or a heart disease or whatever. Every disease known to man is because of toxicity or free radical damage. And go figure, we eat or not eat toxins from the earth. So for this reason alone, we should, we should relook at our belief system of whether or not God really knew what he was doing. How about this? Did you know that pigs are the, one of the highest carriers of disease in the world? The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, states that more than 100 viruses come to the United States each year from China just through pigs. How many have heard of H1N1, the big scare, right? Movies have been made about it. How about mad cow, or the, uh, what are they called? Not the mad cow disease, the, uh, there was another pig one, I can't remember. Swine flu, thank you. I can't document this uh, because she won't go on record to say this, but a friend of mine knows someone that is in the uppity ups in the government in, uh, in the center of disease control, and they will say that every single, she told this person off the record, that every single flu, no to man, comes from pigs. Every one of them. That the swine flu is just, it's marketing. That every one of them, they said it's, it's actually an internal joke to call it a swine flu, because all flu is swine flu. Can't document it, but that's coming from a verbal. How about the trichinella worm? How many would like one of these to be found in your body? How many know there are people eat these things? Did you know on Fox News last year, there was a lady that went in because they thought she had a brain tumor, and when they were in surgery, they opened up her head, and an eight-inch trichinella worm came out. Try not to gross you out, but this stuff is real. What is trichinosis? Trichinosis, what you're looking at right here, is the larva of a trichinella worm. Now, trichinella is found in all kinds of meat, but which meat do they tell you do not undercook? Pork, right? The other white meat, I think is as they call it. And the reason is, is because it's very difficult to cook out trichinosis or the trichinella worm inside of pig because of the way that the pig's flesh is designed, it's not even designed to dissolve uh, into energy. The fat from a pig can't even be dissolved in a human body called hydrolysis, the, co the concept of, of changing an animal fat to human energy because of just the way that a fat's flesh is put together. It, it absorbs the toxins that it eats. So a pig can actually eat a poisonous snake and not get killed. Hundreds of years ago, they would take a herds of pigs, and when they want to build a golf course, they would let the pigs destroy and eat all the snakes, because that's normally where the golfers shoot their golf balls, is into the woods, and they didn't want them getting it, uh, killed by snakes, so the pigs would eat the snakes. They don't die, because they can absorb the toxins, so these trichinella worms will embed themselves into the flesh of these pigs. Now, it doesn't hurt the pigs, but if you don't completely cook it out, and there are some science journals that say that, uh, that, 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 that it actually survives in some more cases than not, then it ends up in your body. And when you eat it, when you eat a pig's flesh, the concept, like I said, of hydrolysis, the process by which fat is converted to energy in the body, the human body can't convert pig fat to human energy. So what happens is, 
is the, the actual fat on a cellular basis embeds itself into your muscles, into your fat, and the fibers of the, of the muscle embed itself on a cellular level, very microscopic level, around the fat cells of the pig. So it takes on a whole meaning, new meaning of you are what you eat. And the body can't get rid of it. It's never designed uh, to be eaten to begin with. It's like eating metal. Metal is not a good thing because it embeds itself uh, even into, your, into the parts of your brain. And uh, there are some science journals that believe that Alzheimer is because of a metal, too much metal in your body. There are certain things you shouldn't eat. Pigs, these are some unclean animals Yahweh says don't eat. Pigs, crawfish, lobster. I love lobster. Okay, anyway, back to the teaching. I used to love lobster. I can't even handle the smell of it anymore. Snails, shrimp, vultures, eagles. Folks, this just makes sense. Most of them are vacuum cleaners of the earth. So now let's begin to move towards Mark, to, to some of these scriptures that are used to support that we can eat these things. Because I know many of you, if you have knowledge of the Bible, you're going to say, well, what about Mark chapter 7? What about Colossians chapter 2? What about Romans chapter 14? So we're going to go through these. We're going to try to do this in this teaching if we can get through all of this. Mark chapter 7, please turn with me. And let's read through these. The Pharisees and some of the scribes assembled to him, having come from Jerusalem and seen some of him taught some of his taught ones, his, uh, his, his disciples, eat bread with defile, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all of the Yehudim do not eat unless they wash their hands thoroughly, holding fast the tradition of the elders. Is there one single place in the Bible that says that you have to wash your hands before or after you eat? No. This was a tradition of the elders, as it says. And it says, And coming from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions which they have received and hold fast, the washing of cups and utensils and copper vessels and couches. Now, I actually believe it's a good idea to wash your hands before you eat. It's not a bad tradition. But they turned it into legalism because it wasn't found in the Scriptures. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do you taught ones not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And Yeshua answered, said to them, well did, did, uh, well did Isaiah prophesy concerning you hypocrites? As it has been written, the people respect me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain they do worship me, teaching as the teachings and commandments of men. So how many places right now, today, we can say that, that, that God's people across the world are actually teaching the commandments of men as the commandments of God? We see that all the time. There are religious denominations that say you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't eat or you can't drink coffee. Where is that in the Bible? You can't drink coffee. You can't drink tea. So they go beyond the scriptures and their interpretation and create other commandments and doctrines. I'm not saying that drinking coffee is good or bad. I'm just saying to make my point, we go beyond the scriptures. Forsaking the commandment of Elohim, you hold fast the tradition of men. He said to them, well, do you set aside the commandment of Elohim in order to guard your tradition? Sounds like us today. For Moshe said, Moses said, respect your father and your mother, and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, or that is a gift, you no longer let him do any matter at all for his father or his mother, nullifying the word of Elohim through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such traditions you do. And calling to the crowd, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is no, listen, here, here's where we get it from. There is no matter that enters a man from the outside which is able to defile him. But it is what comes out of him that defiles the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he went from the crowd into the house, he taught, he taught, uh, he taught his disciples, or his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, Are you not able to understand? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside is unable to defile him? This sure sounds like it's saying that you, whatever you eat cannot defile you. Let's be careful. Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated and purging of all foods. And he said, whatever comes out of a man, that defiles him. 
For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil reasonings, adulteries, whorings, murders, thefts, greedy desires, wickedness, deceit, indecency, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these wicked matters come from within and defile a man. So he goes on, and it goes on to a different subject. Here's what we have to discover. When he goes back into verse 18, he says, Do you not receive whatever, understand that whatever enters a man from outside is unable to defile, defile him? What, is he, what does your Bible say? What does your Bible say? Somebody say, somebody read that verse. There you go. So thus he declares all foods clean. So we need to ask ourselves, what is he talking about? Because when I go into my, when you come into my house and you come over for dinner, and we become good friends, if anybody ever said to this to you, hey, you can have anything I, you want in my house. You can grab anything you want in the refrigerator. It's all yours. Feel free to eat whatever you want. How many have ever said that to a guest or to anybody in your house? Feel free to eat whatever you want. Does that mean that you can eat the, the cat food? Or the antibiotics that are in the refrigerator? Or the shelves of the refrigerator? Or when you're done with the milk, just eat the plastic carton. <laughs> just eat whatever you want. Or was there an understanding there of what food is? So let's go back to Mark chapter 7 and discover that who we're talking to is the Jewish leadership and rabbis. So would you agree with me that Jewish rabbis know exactly what the Torah says of what food is? So are we saying that Rabbi Yeshua is telling the other rabbis that I'm declaring all food clean. You can now eat a vulture. How do we know that? By deduction, two things. Number one, they didn't hang him for it immediately. Why? Because they would have. You cannot have a, a Jewish rabbi in the first century teaching against the Torah or they would have removed his credentials and crucified him at that moment. We know even in the Gospels, in, in, the, uh, in the epistles of Paul, they're trying to hang Paul at any time that he breaks the Torah. At any moment, they're trying to find him and trip him, trip him up so that they can hang him or stone him. And they accused him many times. If Jesus, Yeshua, is saying that you can eat whatever you want and he's going against the Torah, why is it that the very next statement isn't that the Pharisees tore their clothes, they couldn't believe it, and they went to grab the high priest and pull him into the Sanhedrin for a court-martial? Because they knew he wasn't saying that. So what was he saying? Here's exactly what he's saying. Is that the, the religious leaders of that day, if you go back into the early parts of, of, Matthew, of Mark chapter 7, they're saying that the bread is unclean that they've defiled the bread with the unclean hands. And they will also, we'll find out in a moment, that they will say that if you have unclean hands and you touch a clean animal, you make the clean animal unclean. You can't eat it. Do you understand? Okay? Which in a way makes sense. If you've got dirty hands and you put it on bread, who wants to eat the bread after you've touched it with your dirty hands? So there is logic behind this, okay? But they take it into the religious side and they make the entire animal that Yahweh said is clean, clean. What, Yahweh, what Yeshua is saying is they had many, many, many rules about animals and what you could eat and what you could not eat on top of the rules that God gave. So all of the clean animals, they had rules for all the clean animals that it had to be sliced this way, diced this way, salted this way, washed this way. And if you didn't do what they said, the animal itself became unclean. You follow me? Yeshua says, hogwash, my father said it's clean. I don't care if you pour mud on it, it's still clean. You shouldn't have poured the mud on it. But it doesn't make it unfit to eat. It's still clean. So Yeshua stands up as rabbi and of the, of the creator of the universe as the word made flesh, and he says this, I'm declaring that all food that my father said that you can eat, which is the definition of food, is clean. Does this make sense? The definition of food is the key part to Mark chapter 7. If we don't understand the definition of food, when these Jewish rabbis are talking to another Jewish rabbi, and a Jewish rabbi named Yeshua says that all food is clean, we're going to read right into that scripture what we already believe. 
which is we're going to impute our definition of food. Let's continue in Acts chapter 10. Turn with me to Acts chapter 10, please. And we'll go through another scripture. Now, this is probably by far the most brought up set of scriptures when I talk to people uh, about eating things that the Bible says not to eat. This is where you will see them go. And this is where I went when I believed that you can eat whatever you want was Acts chapter 10, Peter's vision. You're very familiar with it, but let's just read it from the beginning so we can all be on the same page. Now, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a captain of what is called the Italian Regiment, dedicated in fearing Elohim with all his household. And by the way, when you hear Elohim, if this is the first time that you've heard that word, that's simply the Hebrew, one of the Hebrew names for God. Okay, plural, majestic magistrate is what it means. Dedicated in fearing God with all his household, doing many kinds of deeds to the people and praying to Elohim always. He clearly saw in a vision about the ninth hour of the day a messenger of Elohim coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. And looking intently at him and becoming afraid, he said, What is it, master? And he said, Your prayers and your kind deeds have come up before remembrance before Elohim. And now send men to Joppa and send for Shimon, who is called Kepha, or Simon Peter. He is staying with Shimon, Simon, a leather tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the messenger who spoke to him went away, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a dedicated soldier from among them who waited on him continually. So this is a rich man. He is a, he's a head of the Italian regiment here, and he is a what they call a God-fear. He is in the process, he is a Gentile, that is in the process of converting to Judaism. He's in the process of converting to Judaism. And so this is kind of the background of Cornelius. This is what we call in the Bible the first Gentile that got saved, although that's not necessarily true, but that's where he gets his fame. So here we go, continuing in verse 8. And having explained to them all, he sent them to Yafo, or Joppa. And on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up to the house to pray. So Peter's at home, and he goes up to his rooftop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became hungry and wished to eat. But while they were preparing... His meal, he fell into a trance. So he sees a vision, and he saw in this vision heaven opening up, and a certain vessel, like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to earth, in which were all kinds of four footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts and creeping creatures, and the birds of the heaven. So, very clear, we have unclean animals that are on this four, uh, four cornered sheet that's being let down from heaven. Very strange vision to Peter. And a voice came, if it isn't strange enough, a voice from heaven comes and says, Rise up, Kepha, slay and eat. Peter, kill and eat. And so Peter responds and says, not at all, Master, because I've never eaten, eaten anything that is common or unclean. So here we go. We have Peter that has this incredibly bizarre vision, and uh, which many uh, pastors and many people, including myself in my former years, interpreted this scripture as, as Peter, uh, God telling Peter that you can now eat whatever you want, as if eating is something that is super spiritual. And that God is sending this message, this memo in the form of a sheet. Now think back to Mark chapter 7, when Yeshua, we just talked about, is saying that I'm declaring all foods clean. If Yeshua at that moment was saying that we can eat anything that we want, and he's telling all the disciples and all the rabbis and everybody in Judaism at that moment that he can eat whatever he wants, first of all, they would have, we, like we talked about, they would have hung him up, strung him up, and crucified him right there. Because you're, he's preaching against the Torah, which you can't do, okay, in first century Judaism, much less today, without being brought before the Sanhedrin and, and, and a court martial type of experience. But if he was really saying that, then why doesn't Peter, because this is almost a decade after Yeshua dies, the Messiah dies, why does Peter not get that memo? Why did he not get that point in Mark chapter 7? Because if he was really saying that, and Peter's paying attention, then in Acts chapter 10, why is it 10 years go by and, 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 and Peter's never eaten anything unclean? He says, I've never eaten anything unclean. So either Yeshua in Mark chapter 7 was not very articulate or he didn't mean. There was no memo. 
sent to Peter or his disciples that you can eat whatever you want. So back to Acts chapter 10 here. Clearly, Peter does not understand the vision at all. Why? Let's continue because you're going to see that this took place in verse 16 three times. The vessel was taken back into heaven three times. Peter had to be given this vision. Why? Because he doesn't get it. So clearly what Peter thought was uh, the interpretation, which is uh, that I can eat unclean animals, clearly that is not what Yahweh, the creator of the universe, wanted Peter to get from the vision. If it was, he would not have given him the vision three times. Is this making sense? Okay, let's continue. So it says, while Peter was doubting within himself what the vision might mean. Why? Because he didn't understand. He thought it was about food, but now after three times, he's starting to get it. He's more American than he thought. So he says, he says, let's see, where were we here? While Kepha was doubting within himself what the vision might mean, the men who had been sent from Cornelius, having asked for the house of Shimon, stood at the gate. And calling out, they inquired whether Simon, also known as Kepha, Peter, was staying there. And Peter was thinking about the vision, and Peter said to him, and the Spirit said to him, See, three men seek you, but rise up and go down and go with them, not doubting at all, for I have sent them. So Kepha went down to the men who had been sent from him, sent from Cornelius, and said, Look, I am the one whom you seek. Why have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the captain, a righteous man, and the one who fears Elohim, and well spoken of by the entire nation of the, the Yehudim, the Jews, was instructed by a set-apart messenger, an angel, to send for you to his house and to hear words from you. So inviting them in, he housed them. And now, by the way, let me give you a little bit of context. This is a big deal. The reason why the Spirit had to come to Peter and tell him to make sure that you, you entertain these guests, these three men that are coming from Cornelius' house, is because there is an oral law in Judaism in the first century that says that a Jew is not allowed to fellowship, eat, cross the threshold, or lock arms with a Gentile. Why? Because the Gentiles were unclean. You see, if you know the oral law, if you know the, 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 the oral law and the traditions and the doctrines of men of, the, of Judaism in the first century, you know right away a Jew, any Jew today could read Acts chapter 10 and know exactly what's going on with this vision because they already consider the Gentiles unclean. So in the first century, it was even worse. They even had idioms, names for the Gentiles. They called them dirty dogs. We even see that in one of the Gospels. Wild beasts, okay. And they were very much wild beasts. They did whatever was right in their own eyes. So the Spirit has to tell Peter, make sure when these Gentiles come, don't shut the door on them, which is going to be what your first inclination is going to be. Let them in. That's where we are in the story. So inviting them in, he housed them, like in verse 23 says. In verse 24, it says, And following day they entered into Caesarea. So he goes with them back to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius was waiting for them, having called together his relatives and close friends. came to be that when Kepha entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet before him. Why? Because he had this unbelievable vision. He's waiting for Peter to show up. He shows up and he's excited because God has told him that this guy, Peter, is going to have an unbelievable message for you. So he gathers everybody he knows. He's a rich man, so can imagine how many people are in his house waiting for this message. Peter walks in like an angel and Cornelius bows at his feet. But Kepha raised him up saying, stand up, I myself am also a man. And talking with him, he went in and found many who had come together. And he said to him, you know that the Jews do not allow me to associate with or go to another race. But Elohim God has shown me that I should not call any man unclean. Let me read that again. Peter walks into the threshold of the house. He's not allowed to do that according to Jewish law. And he says... 
You know that in Yehudi man is not allowed, the Jewish man is not allowed to associate with or go to another race. But God has shown me that what God says is clean, let no man call unclean. Somewhere between Jerusalem and Caesarea, somewhere between the moment where the Spirit showed him the, 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 the four-cornered sheet with the unclean animals to the moment that he walks into Cornelius' house, he has a, 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 a revelatory moment where he understands what the vision is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, he, he, was, he was completely confused about the sheet that came down three times with these unclean animals on it. And I would imagine somewhere, maybe this is just conjecture, but just for fun, picture, picture Peter on a chariot, on a horse, a camel, whatever it was, and he's going down to Cornelius' house, and he's sitting next to these three Gentiles, and he knows he's not supposed to do this. He's feeling a bit uncomfortable at the moment. He looks over, and he sees these Gentiles, and then he closes his eyes maybe for a moment and he sees this, this four-cornered sheet and he sees these unclean animals and then he remembers that the Ruach, the Spirit tells him to go with these three men. He's not allowed to go with these three men and all of a sudden he has this revelation, holy smokes, these are unclean people. I see unclean animals. Yahweh tells me to eat. Peter, go up, kill and eat. Now I know what's going on. We're not, we, we thought we weren't allowed to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. We thought that the good news of Yeshua coming and dying for the whole house of Israel, for all mankind, was just for the Jews. We didn't know that it was for the rest of Israel. We did not know that it was for the rest of the nations, the goyim, the fullness of the nations. So Yahweh makes it very clear that I did not send my son to just die for one race. I came to to send my son to die for the entire world. And Peter, I want you to be the one to start the process of the dominoes falling and the shofar going out to the four corners of the earth.
There's no 